okay, wait a minute. I got four configurations. I got two archetypes. I got, I got four phases of propulsion and seven components of force. Good morning. Happy Friday. I have no coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. A little bit of a different Friday. My schedule's a little different, got different calls, and we're shooting a bunch of stuff for iFastU today. Um, reminder, if you're not signed up for iFastU University, please do so. You're missing out. We got some really good stuff up there. We got some great people that are involved um, with that. Great questions. So uh, uh, please join us on that. Speaking of joining us, yesterday's uh, Coffee and Coaches conference call was pretty awesome. So I'm going to show a second segment of that today because um, it was really good. Um, we covered everything from connective tissue behaviors. We talked about a bunch of static stretching stuff. Um, but uh, today's segment is on the connective tissue behavior, making comparisons between exercises as to as to what your response will be. Very important when you're, when you're uh, writing some programming. And then we also talked about the influences of, of, of the structural elements as to how they would be applied to programming as well. So I think there's a lot of good questions that were asked and answered. Um, so I think you'll like these segments. Uh, reminder, the podcast will be up on Sunday. Um, so you get to review all of that um, via audio. Don't forget to sign up for the uh, YouTube channel so you can get the, the videos first and foremost. And then I will see you guys next week. Have a great weekend. I'm going to stick with the connective tissue theme a little sure. bit. Um, so I know we, we talked about kind of like drop and catch variations versus like a back squat or front squat and something in terms of how like the tissues would behave less stiff versus more stiff respectively. And I think I'm just kind of confusing myself a little bit. Um, okay. So I guess like the way at least I'm thinking about it right now in my head, it's not making sense why they would behave less versus more stiffly. Cause the way I'm looking at it is like with that drop and catch variation, like, yes, like it's unweighted for a second and then you're dropping underneath it. But from like the, if you, it seems like you're almost just like changing the starting point of when you begin to interact with the load. Yes. So I guess I'm not seeing how from like that starting point to the bottom of the movement, it would be different. Okay. Other than like visually, I can see how the speed of the movement's quicker with one, but that doesn't correlate with the, the rate of loading of the tissues so that I'm getting, I'm getting lost there. Okay. Um, are we, are, give me, give me an exercise that we're talking about so I can, I can speak from a, a very clear frame of reference. Um, so if you just have like a kettlebell kind of like clean and then drop underneath it. Okay. Right. Like back so, so, so th no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. So, um, you're, you're, you're doing the drop and the catch, right? And so you do one where you're actually all the way down at the catch. Okay. And then you do one that's about halfway between the drop and the catch. Is there a difference between the two? So you're saying wh where I finished the movement? Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. They, What's the difference? What's the difference? Because you, you have less time to slow it down. Okay. Great. Less time. Okay. So less time would be a faster rate, correct? Less time would be a faster rate. Yes. Okay. So you've just differentiated which one would produce a stiffer response in regards to the connective tissues. Same Got exercise, time-based response, right? Shorter time, faster rate, stiffer tissues. Longer time, slower rate, more yield. So then be like with like a, just like a, a regular loaded type squat, like because you're not really like trying to drop underneath and like slow it, make it come to a stop. Like it's almost like already stopped. That's why you get that super stiff behavior with it or the, the most stiff behavior with it. Okay. Once again, so here we go. Same exercise. You're squatting with a barbell. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. 89.7% of your 1RM load on your back. 40% of your 1RM load on your back. Same squat, same depth. Which one is stiffer? The 89.7. Yeah. So again, you have to differentiate. So, so you know how I'm, I'm fond of talking about the seven components of force, right? 
So each one of those will create a, a, a different behavior in regards to how the connector tissues will respond to, to load, time, frequency, variability, et cetera, et cetera, right? But when you make a direct comparison like this, it's a little bit easier to see the difference between one and, and the other, how it would affect those tissues. Yep. So in addition to just like the drop and catch versus like the continuous squat, like differentiation of those two, yeah, there's another big reason you just get more yielding capacity because like you can't do the other one with as much weight. So that's a factor. That is a factor, but it, there's also a greater time between uh, 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 there, there's actually, it, it, it looks fast. Visually, you're dropping quickly. It looks fast. But the amount of time that the tissues are exposed before they would reach like the peak magnitude of that, that effort mm -hmm. is longer. Yeah. You see, you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have, we have to be aware of that. Right. And, and again, it's, it's dirty and gray. It's like, well, wait a minute, it's the magnet. Like, so then so I, get, I get a lot of questions about this kind of stuff and, and people give me like four categories. Like, okay, so if I'm using this magnitude and we're going at this speed, it's like, okay, give me a direct comparison so you can understand the difference because all of this stuff is happening at the same time, right? I yeah. talk about seven components of force as if they're individual, individually applied but they're all applied at the same time. One might, might be represented to a greater degree. So if we're talking about a really high percentage of your one RM, magnitude might be the most important thing on my mind right now, because that's what I am targeting um, from an intent standpoint. You see, it's like, what do you, what do you want the, the, the end result to be? So if I have an intention, how can I manipulate this exercise, knowing how these, these forces are applied to the tissues, knowing what the response should be based on the properties of viscoelastic tissues. It's like, and then what is the outcome? And that's how you know you did it right. Cause you say, I want this, this end result, I'm going to do this. And then this happened, you go, way to go me. Or you go, hmm, I need to rethink what I'm doing. Yep, right. that's helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Nate, it's been a long time since you've asked the question, brother. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm listen, listening, absorbing. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go back to uh, Luke's question way, way, way in the very beginning. Um, Man, I don't even have a memory of that. Go ahead. I, it's all right. I got you. Um, <laughs> um, it's a related decline. I can't help it. Yeah. Well, then it's not your fault then. Well, the, the great thing is I can read the same book every day and it, it seems new to me. So that's, that's a nice thing. Yeah. Um, so I think I need to make like a, a exercise selection chessboard kind of thing. Um, Cause like, I, I think I have some representations in my head, but I think I need to put it down on paper. So um, you mentioned when Luke was talking about like kind of progression and exercise selection, you had configuration, bias, for force production, and propulsion were kind of those main factors, right? Okay. Are there mm -hmm. any more that you would add to that? Oh, maybe I don't know. I was just I was just riffing. Uh, well, yeah, so I'm just no. Now you can <sighs> think about it. A so little. two archetypes, four phases of Two archetypes, four phases of propulsion. Pr propulsion. Boy, I can't even speak now. Let me start over. Two archetypes, four phases of propulsion, four configurations, seven components of force. Yep. Got it. Bingo. I was just wondering if you would if you would put any more in there as far as days principles of, the, of exercise selection of or not. Days of the week, maybe. I don't know. Um, no, I think I think if you if you can if you can address all of that. I, I think that that becomes very powerful, right? Because um, like I said, that's a lot of information that's available to you to make a decision. <clears throat> the, the hard thing is gonna be is categorizing activities, right? Because some things are very, very similar, some things, and then we go back to, to you know Zach's question. It's like, you know, we can see the difference in, in the yielding actions based on time and, and within the same exercise. It's, it's very easy. Like if we're just talking about like some kind of squat um, exercise, we can, we can distinguish things 
you know, from a from a force standpoint, we can see those differences. But can you see the differences between, like I said, hurdle jumps and split squats? You know, and then it becomes there's a whole lot of stuff going on. And so what, what you're going to do there is you're just going to make sure that your intention is included in that activity. And then the question mark is, is, is it enough where it has the impact for the change that you desire? So that's right? you so if I'm trying to capture early, if I'm trying to capture an early propulsive strategy and I, and I put somebody in a split squat with their, their foot on a ramp, right? Um, I could also do a TRX squat where they're leaning backwards and capture early there too mm -hmm. which one should i use whatever you have available well it's it's it it, it comes there, there's other there's other needs like there's other reasons like okay so the split squat's going to induce a little bit more turn the trx is going to limit some turn so where do i want to place the emphasis right am i trying to make a change that's that's a little bit more you know centrally driven where i need more like I'm trying to drive counter mutation of the of the sacrum versus just creating the turn, which would imply that I've already got some element of counter mutation available to me. So then maybe I bias myself towards the TRX squat to create the to create the counter mutation first, right? You see it? Yeah. You see it? You see it? It's like it's like you can, you can go deep, 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 deep on this stuff. You just got to make sure that your intention is included in the activity, and then. You and you have fun. something to test it against, right? Absolutely. Well, there you go. So now you get back to key performance indicator. You say, okay, what, what change am I trying to make? How will it be represented? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good question. Yeah. Grace. Hey, uh, I have a question for you, Grace. Un unmuted. Fire away. Uh, did I hear a nasty rumor that you're gonna you're gonna be coming to IFAST in the in the summertime? You did, and it's okay. I'll be taking uh, nearly 100 percent accurate. I'll, I'll be taking the summer off. No way. The whole summer, not gonna be there. Yeah. You're lying. Of course, I'm lying. Great. There's only two places. There's only two. <laughs> there's only two places in the whole world that I go: this corner of my house and IFAST. Like literally, I don't know how to go anywhere else. Um, so I, I'm just trying to weigh the balance of, uh, if I want a client to have a training effect, but also regain motion, like that side plank row, isn't going to accomplish the regain motion side, but would give them the training effect. So it's like, I'm thinking about how to balance both of, both of those things. Okay. Um, so, so what would be your indication of the training effect? What training effect do we want as a result of the activity? That's, that's your, that's your first question. And I'm not saying you have to answer it. I'm just saying that's the first sure. question that you have to answer. So every time, every time that you, you intervene, you, you want to have an intent and that intent should be um, measurable in some way, shape or form, whether it be your coach's eye or you're going to have some other activity that, that you're going to make a comparison with like a before and an after or whatever. Okay. You don't just blindly say, oh, we we're going to train today. Right. Right. And, that, and that's all fine and wonderful. Sometimes you just want to play and I get it. But, but in general, when, when we're intervening, you, you want to have purpose behind what you're doing. And then mm -hmm. you have to be able to identify when you have met that intention. Right. Right. So then thinking back to Luke's original question of like clients who have general goals of either wanting to look better and feel better, yep. those two are often opposed when it comes to uh, hypertrophy goals or feeling better in many cases might mean people need more expansion. Yes. Um, so like, how would you how do you tend to in your model? Well, since you're mostly seeing people for pain, but maybe thinking the performance side of like clients that come to iFast to train, how do you weigh those interventions in your like process of like introing them and getting them started into programs? Okay. So, so we identify what, the, what they need first and foremost. Okay. If, if it's a performance related client, then performance is the goal, right? Okay. 
So we identify what their, what their needs are under those circumstances. And then we identify what the interference is, if there is any. So sometimes we get like, literally I had one dude that came in, he was a, a pitcher for the Kansas City Royals. And I saw him walk in, I was like, this guy doesn't need me at all. Go train him, do whatever you want. Like literally do whatever you want. He was like a specimen of this perfect representation of relative motions and perfectly happy, like go lucky kind of a guy. Um, and so we didn't really have any interference. So we, so we could, we could pick out, it's like, what do we need to focus on for performance? And we did that. Okay. The thing you want to do though is, is, is look at, look at narrowing like this, this scope of what you're going to be working on. That will be very, very helpful. So if I need to raise performance, depending on the level of the athlete, the higher the level of the athlete, the smaller the window of change there is, therefore the greater volume of activity that is required to make a significant change. So force production is easy to talk about. Very rarely do I need to work on it with my professional athletes, but we, but we do at times. Um, so let's just say force production is, is the goal. And so I'm gonna have them pull something up off the floor that's very, very heavy, right? So I can focus on that. So his greatest training volume associated with the, with the, the, um, the primary um, uh, adaptation that we're chasing that has the greatest volume. I do all that. If there's anything that interferes that's associated with that, I spend most of my time undoing that mm. to whatever degree that I can without interfering with the force production. So, so this, is, this, is a tough, this is a tough thing to, to execute because I, I, do, I need something, right? But I don't want to. I don't want to take away. I don't want to destroy the efforts that I just, um, you know, um, put this guy through to make a change. But that's basically how you do it. You say, okay, what do I need for performance? Is there something that that if I gave him this, his performance could potentially improve? I got to do it. What are the what are the secondary consequences? And then, so when you and Nate get off this call and you guys hang out and you're and you're talking about, okay, wait a minute, I got four configurations, I got two archetypes, I got I got four phases of propulsion and seven components of force. That's it's very very useful because you'll be able to say, if I do this activity, I'll get the return on investment that I'm trying to, but. I have this interference and you go, but wait a minute, but what if we change the rate over here? And I say, now I'm doing, instead of doing like a, like a slow, slower tempo split squat, then maybe I'm doing something that's a little bit more oscillatory and I eliminate the thing that was going to create interference that's associated with that activity. So I, that, that's one of the advantages of looking at things under these circumstances is because I can um, categorize the the primary influence and then i can also identify secondary consequences because what a lot of people do is they get the primary influence correct that's easy it's the secondary consequences that'll come back and create the the problems mm 